Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word, presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. Come to the book of Judges. The judges in the book of Judges aren't like the judges within our court systems. The uh, judges are actually deliverers. What you find with Judges, it's a, it's a fascinating book, and it's a book of the cycles that mankind often goes through. Israel, in, in your Bibles, is really a picture of mankind as a whole. What's true of Israel is so often true of all mankind. There are are seven departures from God and Judges where they do what is right in their own eyes. And that sounds like uh, a lot like our world today. The cycles and Judges go like this. The people of Israel do what is right in their own eyes. And God allows a foreign power to conquer or oppress Israel as a result. And God raises up a judge to deliver them out of those situations. Two of the judges are names you probably will recognize, Gideon and Samson. Men like them would deliver Israel out of those times. Then Israel would turn back to God for a time. But then they'd slowly drift back into doing what was right in their own eyes. And then that oppression or bondage would come and then there'd be another deliverance. You see these cycles of a broken people who had a faithful God. God was gracious to Israel throughout all of this. And it makes you thankful because He's gracious to us too in our ups and downs and times we drift away and the times we come back to the Lord. After the book of Judges in 1 Samuel, the people cry out for a king. They wanted a king to rule over them like all the other nations of the world. God uses Samuel to call Israel's first king and anoint him. Saul was Israel's first king. Israel's first three kings each reigned 40 years each. Saul reigned for 40 years. David reigned for 40 years. Solomon reigned for 40 years. There is an important event in Scripture that takes place in 2 Samuel chapter 7. King David is he's sitting in his palace one day and he thinks how it isn't right that he should be in a palace when the ark of God in God's dwelling place was in a tent or the tabernacle. So David decides to build a house or a temple for the ark of God and for God's dwelling place. In response to this, God was well pleased and he makes a covenant with David and promises him that David's house, his kingdom, and his throne would be established forever and ever. Second Samuel 7.16 says, and thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. This promise of an everlasting kingdom and throne will be fulfilled through the seed of David, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, when Christ establishes his everlasting throne and kingdom of heaven on the earth. This is the hope for the nation of Israel. Scripture goes on to tell about David gathering the materials for the temple and then Solomon ultimately building the temple and dedicating Solomon's son. Rehoboam was the king of Israel. Part of Israel complains to Rehoboam about the heavy taxation and forced labor from Solomon, his father. Rehoboam then doesn't listen to the counsel of his older advisors to treat the people kindly and to be a servant unto them. Instead, he listens to the advice of his younger advisors to threaten the people with still heavier demands. And this results in a split between the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. When you read your Old Testament, that's a, an important thing to know. Because you'll see when you read the Old Testament, it will talk about Israel and Judah. Israel is the north, Judah is the south. Rehoboam's brother Jeroboam becomes king of the ten northern tribes, which become known 
as Israel. Rehoboam remained the king in Judah with two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, in the south. It's during this time that Isaiah, Elijah, and Hosea come on the scene. These are prophets that prophesy against the ten northern tribes of Israel because they immediately started going down the road of idolatry and rebellion against God. God's prophets would say, Thus saith the Lord. And by the word of the Lord, they commanded Israel to turn away from their idolatry and turn back to the true and the living God. But as a result of their continued disobedience, God allows a foreign power, the nation of Assyria, to come down and take the northern kingdom and tribes of Israel captive. Assyria conquers Israel in 722 B.C., and they take them out of the land. They were carried away by the Assyrian captivity. Then God starts sending prophets to the southern tribes because now they started doing the same thing that the northern tribes did. They were involved in idolatry and wickedness, rebellion and marrying wives of other nations. God calls Jeremiah, Habakkuk, Zephaniah on the scene and they start prophesying against the southern kingdom of Judah to turn back to the Lord. They tell them to remember what happened to the north and that the same thing was going to happen to them if they didn't forsake their idolatry and turn back to the Lord. But like the northern kingdom, Judah doesn't listen, so God allows the southern tribes to be taken away captive by the Babylonians under King Nebuchadnezzar. A doctor once asked a patient if any members of his family suffered from insanity, and he replied, no. We all seem to enjoy it. The family of Abraham made the same mistakes over and over, and they seem to enjoy the insanity. But again, Israel is a picture of the human, whole human race, which true of Israel is often so true of all of us. And we don't learn from our mistakes sometimes. We harden our hearts. We turn from God. We go our own way. And we face the consequences of sin and disobedience. And that's the general principle you see with Israel. Judah is taken captive in three waves. 605, 597, and 586 B.C. The one in 586 is the final one where they conquer Jerusalem. They burn the temple. They plunder the temple vessels and ornaments. They take the people out of Judah and they burn the city they carry the people of Judah captive all the way to the far and distant land in the east and to Babylon. And they slaughter people on the way as well. This is where you get your books of Daniel and Ezekiel. Daniel was taken in the first wave of captivity in 605 B.C. to Babylon. Ezekiel was taken in the second wave in 597 B.C. And that's how they both end up there in Babylon. So if you've ever read Daniel and Ezekiel and you've wondered, why are they in Babylon? You know, that's why. They get carried away into Babylon through the Babylonian captivity. And both Daniel and Ezekiel faithfully minister there for the Lord as his prophets. And they prophesy to Israel in their captivity. Judah left in three waves to go to Babylon. And, they, and then they come back to the land in three waves. King Cyrus gives Israel permission and lets them return. A man by the name of Zerubbabel leads the first wave back to Jerusalem. He leads them back to rebuild the temple. The prophets Haggai and Zechariah prophesy against the people back in Israel during this time because they stopped building the temple. And they call on them to get back to work. They get to Jerusalem and they start building it, but then they start getting comfortable in their daily lives and they become more concerned about their houses than God's house and they leave off working on the temple. So God calls these two prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, to finish the job, see it through, finish the temple. There are principles in this for us about prioritizing the Lord's work and not allowing the temporal to distract us from the eternal and finishing what we start for the Lord. Ezra leads the second wave back of people back to Jerusalem. He comes back calling the people to get back to God's law. 
And he tells them also to not intermarry with the other nations. The third wave is led by Nehemiah. He comes back under God's call to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem. He did this to secure it from the other nations that might attack it. Three waves out, three waves back in, and then a 400 year gap between Malachi and Matthew where God does not speak. We'll be returning to the program in just a minute, but first we'd like to take this time to thank you, our partners, for making these programs possible. If you would like to access our library of helpful Bible study tools, go to BereanBibleSociety.org. Moses and Paul, The Dispensers of Law and Grace, is a paperback 86-page book written by Pastor Cornelius R. Stamm. Here is a simple approach to dispensational truth that should prove both refreshing and helpful to you in your study of the Word of God. Paul's message and ministry was distinct and separate from that of the Twelve. He was committed to the doctrine and program for a new dispensation, the dispensation of the grace of God. The failure to recognize this important fact lies as the root of the confusion which has gripped the church for so long, and Moses and Paul helps to dispel this confusion. To receive our free full-color 32-page monthly magazine, The Berean Searchlight, Call 262-255-4750 or subscribe online at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. Thank you again for your generous gifts. And now, back to the teaching with Pastor Kevin. John the Baptist comes in accord with prophecy. Isaiah 40, verse 3 says, A voice cries in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. John comes preparing the way for the king that was coming after him, the Lord Jesus Christ, preparing Israel to accept him as their king and Messiah. John the Baptist comes preaching the gospel of the kingdom because that was their kingdom established on the earth, ruled by their Messiah and king. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're all a continuation of the Old Testament of prophecy and Israel's prophecies and the promises made to her. You see the constant fulfillment of prophecy through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the things that take place in the gospel records. From Bethlehem to the cross in the resurrection, it all has a flow of fulfillment of prophecy showing that Israel, showing Israel that Jesus is Israel's Messiah. And he is the seed of David and their king. You have a consistent theme of a kingdom to be established on the earth. You have teachings concerning the kingdom on the earth and the tribulation period that precedes that kingdom and how Israel is to live and to serve God in and through it all, in the tribulation and in the millennial kingdom. In the Gospels, we find the Lord's earthly kingdom teachings, including the charter of the kingdom with the Lord's Sermon on the Mount. And in the Gospels, as we all know, we see the Lord's compassion, we see His wisdom, we see His power, we see that He's 100% man and that He is 100% God. But the Lord said Himself in Matthew 15, 24, I am not sent, that is by the Father, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Christ came to Israel and Christ came for Israel. Christ came in accordance with the promises and covenants made to Israel and to make that nation a light and a blessing to all the families and all the nations of the world. And that goes back to Abraham, back to the promise God made to Abraham concerning this in Genesis chapter 12. For that to take place, it had to be through Christ as their king and their Messiah. He came to make Israel that bright light and that blessing to all the world in accordance with God's plan. And God was faithful to that plan. But Israel rejected Christ and they had him crucified, as we know. And he rose again, as we know, triumphant over sin and death. After his ascension, we go into the book of Acts. Acts is called Acts 
because it details the acts of the apostles after the Lord ascended back to heaven. One of the first things to take place in the book of Acts is Pentecost. Pentecost was a Jewish feast day that takes place 50 days after the feast of Passover. The Lord had promised in his earthly ministry that he would send another comforter, that the Holy Spirit would come to this world after he departed to heaven. And that's what takes place in Acts chapter 2. But that again was in fulfillment of prophecy. In Acts chapter 2 verse 16, Peter, speaking of the coming of the Holy Spirit, says, This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. The coming of the Spirit at Pentecost did not mark the beginning of the church. It was just a continuation of prophecy in God's plans for Israel. You need to take note in Acts chapter 2 who is being addressed. And you find Peter addressing ye men of Judea, ye men of Israel. We are not Israel. We are the body of Christ today. Israel rejected God the Father in the past, in the Old Testament, with their idolatry. Israel rejected God the Son in the Gospel records when they had Him crucified. The book of Acts details and tells us and teaches us when Israel rejected God the Holy Spirit in His ministry. In Acts 2 through 7, we see the Holy Spirit's ministry to Israel. But you see Israel again hardening their heart and they reject the Spirit, which climaxes in Acts chapter 7 when they kill a man filled with the Holy Spirit. They stone Stephen and they kill him with their own hands. Acts 7, 55 to 58 says, But he, Stephen, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. The next thing you read after Acts chapter 7 and in Acts chapter 8 verse 1 is, And Saul. And that's where God was turning now, to a new man, to a new apostle, to a new program. It is at this point that God's plans for Israel are temporarily suspended and Israel is set aside in her unbelief. In Acts chapter 9, Christ appears from heaven with a bright light, Saul struck down to the ground, and Christ saves Paul on the road to Damascus. Acts 9, 3 and 4 says, And as he journeyed, that is Paul, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? This is completely different, completely apart from anything you find in prophecy. The book of Acts is a book of transition. It starts with one nation, Israel. It ends with the nations, the Gentiles, and the body of Christ. It starts with Peter, and it ends with Paul. You find a transition in that book away from Israel's program under the law to a new program for the Gentiles today under grace. For the last 2,000 years, man has been living in an age in dispensation of grace. It started with the salvation of the Apostle Paul, and it will end with the rapture of the church, the body of Christ. The dispensation began with an appearance of Christ from heaven to save the chief of sinners by grace. And the dispensation ends with an appearance from Christ, of Christ from heaven to catch away the church to heaven by grace before the tribulation period ever begins. We are not under law. We are under grace. And we find our grace letters for today in Romans through Philemon which are directly addressed to the church, the body of Christ. The church, the body of Christ, is found nowhere else in Scripture. Be a Berean about that. You can search the Scriptures and you'll never find the body of Christ ever mentioned, except in Paul's letters. It is only mentioned by Paul because it was only revealed to the Apostle Paul. 
The body of Christ was a new church for a new dispensation, which was revealed only to Paul. Today there are new terms of salvation, the gospel of the grace of God. This gospel says to just trust that Christ died for your sins personally, was buried, and rose again, as 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 says. Placing your faith in that simple gospel message, we are saved by God's grace through faith alone. And we have the sure hope of heaven and eternal life. In Paul's epistles, we find a completely different program and a dispensation of grace that was never before revealed in the past. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 2, 5, and 9, it says, If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me, that is to Paul, to you word, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God. This dispensation, this program of grace is outside of prophecy. You can't find the dispensation of grace in prophecy or the Old Testament. And in this dispensation, absolutely no prophecy is being fulfilled because we are outside of prophecy. These prophecies that were made in the Old Testament and through the prophets, those were made for the nation of Israel. The tribulation is part of prophecy, and it's foretold in Jeremiah 30, verse 7, that it is the time of Jacob's trouble. It is Israel. It's a time that Israel must go through. It's Israel's time of trouble and suffering before the glory that follows of their kingdom of heaven on the earth. This dispensation of grace is outside of prophecy and ends with an event that is not found in prophecy, the rapture or the catching away of the church, the body of Christ to heaven before the tribulation begins. We will not see one single second of the future tribulation period because that is prophetic ground and it's for Israel. And it is part of God's plans and purposes for her. And we are not Israel. We are the body of Christ. Christ comes at the rapture to catch the church, the body of Christ, away off the earth to heaven. And he catches us to heaven because that's our hope. And then God will usher back in that prophetic program with Israel. And prophecy will again be fulfilled at that time, literally. He will fulfill literally all the promises He has made to Israel. If God was unfaithful to one promise He made to the nation of Israel, then we have every reason to question whether He will be faithful to the promises He made to us. He will fulfill all those promises. The promises made to Israel were literal. They will be literally fulfilled in every way. His faithfulness to Israel reassures us that he will be faithful to every promise he has made to us in the church, the body of Christ. After we go at the rapture, the books of Hebrews to Revelation will be used during those at that time. That will be directly applicable for those people during that time. Hebrews to Revelation addresses Israel for that time period. In the tribulation, they'll go back to the Gospels, they'll go back to Daniel, they'll go back to Psalms, they'll look to Hebrews to Revelation for how they are to live during that time of the tribulation and within the millennial kingdom. The Antichrist will be revealed during that day. He will burst onto the world scene after the rapture. The horrific seven-year tribulation and time of God's wrath then takes place. According to the seal judgments in the tribulation, Peace will be removed from the earth. Then you have the true Christ coming at the end of the tribulation period. Christ at his first coming to Israel came all the way down to the earth. At his second coming to Israel, he comes all the way down to the earth and he will stand on the Mount of Olives. Zechariah 14, 4 says, And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. At his first coming for Israel, he came to rescue Israel from her sins. At his second coming for Israel, he comes to rescue Israel from the Antichrist and the tribulation period. 
The Antichrist comes to do battle against Christ at the Battle of Armageddon. Christ then comes at his second coming in power and in great glory at that time and crushes him and crushes. He roars as he descends and by the power of his word, people melt away. A supernatural confusion takes place where the army of the Antichrist begins killing each other like in the days of Gideon. Israel also fights against the Antichrist army and is empowered by their Lord to do so. All of this results in a river of blood that reaches to the horse's bridle. And Christ utterly defeats the Antichrist and his satanic one world government. Satan is then cast into the bottomless pit for a thousand years in the center of the earth. And Christ establishes his millennial kingdom on the earth, the time of heaven on the earth. After the millennial kingdom, Satan is released from the bottomless pit. He then deceives those who do not trust Christ during the kingdom and raises an army. And they come to do battle with God at the battle of Gog and Magog. It's amazing the pride of man to do battle with God. And that battle is just a blip on the radar screen. God speaks from heaven. Fire comes down from heaven and consumes them all and it's over. And Satan is then cast into the lake of fire forever and ever. That's followed by the great white throne where all the unbelieving of all the ages will be brought before Christ. They will be judged according to their works and their sins and cast into the lake of fire. All who appear at the great white throne will be cast into the lake of fire. Then comes eternity in the dispensation of the fullness of times. Ephesians 1.10 says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven, that's us, the church, the body of Christ, and which are on earth, and that's the nation of Israel, even in him. Everything in the end is summed up in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have any questions, Please contact us anytime at Brian Bible Society. Our phone number is 262-255-4750. Our email address is berean at bereanbiblesociety.org. Thank you for watching. During our next time together in the Word, we're going to be looking at understanding your Bible and the importance of rightly dividing the Word of Truth. Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God. For more information, visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750. Or if you prefer, write us at the Berean Bible Society P.O. Box 756, Germantown, Wisconsin, 53022. Now until next time, may you be transformed by God's grace.